Good morning. Good morning. This is one of the, well, not the last time, but it won't be long before I'll be up there on that stage. Uh, you know, when, when that other stage is there, I never preached a single time from it because it was way too high. <laughs> and so it'll be a little different for a while, get used to, but uh, I'm excited about what God's doing and the opportunity that we have to maybe fix some of our little sound issues and, and stuff. We might need to invest in some newer equipment, but <laughs> so that things won't go wrong. Sorry about the piano issue this morning, but uh, it's the nature of the beast when you deal with technology. We're going to continue our study in 1 Corinthians, and uh, today we're studying 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through chapter 3, verse 4, if we can get it all in. But I just want to read a couple of verses to get us there, to get us started. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom that you have given us in Christ. And Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us and revealed your plans to us, at least in some degree. And Father, we, we thank you for that and pray that you would help us to understand what you have revealed. Lord, we know that without the Spirit, uh, we would indeed be unable to understand, unable to comprehend all the things that you have for us in Christ Jesus. And so we are thankful for the gift that you've given us in the Spirit, who leads us into all truth, Lord. Help us to follow that leading. Help us to, in fact, pursue the leading of the Spirit so that we can indeed walk in wisdom and in the truth of Jesus Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, after his initial greeting, Paul immediately begins to offer correction for the problems in Corinth that had been reported to him. And the first problem, <coughs> excuse me, the first problem is division that is rooted in the Corinthians' embrace of their culture especially in regard to the, the value they placed on human wisdom and sophistry. And as a result, they engaged in factionalism, uh, you know, this divisiveness, this infighting, and they did it by elevating particular teachers. Usually it seemed like they were, they were doing so on the basis of the, the idea of who was the best speaker, most eloquent, or who had the, the best wisdom, at least from the context of Paul's arguments. So Paul confronts this factionalism by confronting the premise that human wisdom is essential in knowing God. Quite the contrary. God has instituted a plan whereby human wisdom, or worldly wisdom, if you will, is negated, and that plan is rooted in the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul himself did not use worldly human wisdom in preaching to the Corinthians, but focused on the message that seemed foolish to the Greeks and caused the Jews to stumble in unbelief. And so we saw in uh, second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, it says, And my speech, Paul says, and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in, in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so that's how we finished last week. Well, today our text... Uh, <coughs> draws from that last statement. And concerning our text, uh, Siampa and Rosner write, having demolished the false wisdom that had in part led to divisions in Corinth, Paul seeks to put genuine wisdom in its place. Up to this point, Paul has emphasized the foolishness of the gospel. Now he turns to the gospel as a wisdom from God. And Blumberg notes, he's, he develops, Paul develops this his point by contrasting two different pairs of people. That's what we're going to see in this section. Christians versus non-Christians, and then spiritual Christians versus worldly Christians. Siemp and Rosner again uh, observed that in Romans 1, Paul outlines his conviction that the rejection of wisdom from God leads to sexual immorality, which is going to be dealt with 
early on in, in the epistle to the Corinthians. And idolatry, which is another major issue that's dealt with in Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 through 3, 4, our, our text, has a relevance beyond chapters 1 through 4 in this epistle. They, they're relevant to the whole argument that Paul is going to make because Paul is going to focus on those two things that were uh, of high concern to the Jews among Gentiles, sexual immorality and idolatry. And so when you think of Corinthians, you, you, those are the kind of the major topics that he's dealing with in one form or another. Now, they also note that the main challenge of interpretation in these particular verses is working out who is who. You know, who is, who is speaking and who is being referenced? Because sometimes it's hard to tell. So we'll try to give some light onto that without getting too deep into the arguments. So let's go ahead and do our exposition. <clears throat> chapter, uh, First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, and we're going to focus on the mature believer here. Paul says, however, we speak wisdom. Remember, he says, I didn't, I didn't use human wisdom to preach the gospel. I just focused on the cross. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they, for had they known they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, notice what he's doing. He's speaking wisdom to the mature. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, Paul says. And so, this is not Paul shunning all wisdom. This is not him saying, oh, let's, we're Christians, let's just be idiots. Let's not use our minds. Remember the point that I made the last time wasn't that, that, uh, that the Bible or, or you know, the gospel calls us to be empty-minded. It's just that through intellectualism, you'll never come to know God because you're missing the very first step, and that is humility before God in dealing with your sin. And if you're just going the intellectual route, you're not acknowledging your sin, then your intellect is still at odds and at war with God. And, you, you know, you're going to come up with reasons and arguments as to why the Scriptures are not true. So, so Paul is... is is saying that God has not shunned all wisdom. Wisdom, There is a true wisdom from God, and that's what Paul proclaims to those who are mature. It's important to note here that all believers have access to the wisdom of God. There isn't a special class of elite believers. Everyone has the same resource, the revelation of God. It came through the prophets, came through the apostles. We have God's word and God's spirit, so we have access to the wisdom of God. But Paul is recognizing that some believers have moved into maturity and it's to them that he speaks the wisdom of God. I'm going to have a rough morning this morning. My throat is, man, is that, might be that uh, insulation back there. <laughs> Blame it on Lyle. Uh, it, it's, it's the allergies, but whew, man. So bear with me, I might be drinking a lot this morning. So. The, 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 the point is that Paul is going to uh, uh, speak wisdom to the mature, but not the wisdom of the world. He says, not, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Remember, we talked about God bringing their wisdom to nothing. Now, from what was already written, uh, he, he's obviously not speaking of worldly wisdom. He's talking about God's wisdom. But there's an interesting question here in regards to the identity of the rulers of this age. Who's Paul talking about? He doesn't really clarify. Now, there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of back and forth. I'm not going to get into the arguments. It just, just takes too much time. But I'm going to, to say that 
this is probably speaking of both human rulers at the time and the demonic influences behind them. Uh, some, you, you can make a case for it being either one, and I think that really, truly, that this is, is both. It's the human rulers that oppose Christ, but also the demonic forces that oppose him. Now notice what he says. He's not speaking that wisdom of the, of the, of the age, the wisdom of the world, but in verse 7 he says, well, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now who's the we there? Remember, the, one of the questions is, who's he talking, who's who here? Who's the we? Again, just to, to skip all the argumentation, I'm just going to tell you what I come to, concluded, and that is the we is the apostles, Paul and the apostles. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Well, a, a second question then arises, what is this hidden mystery wisdom of God? It's not the gospel, that's for all people. And, and, and it's presented to all people. And it's more specific than just saying, the, oh, it's the full scope of God's teaching on salvation, the Christian life. I think it's more specific than that. That's, yeah, it would include wisdom about the, the, you know, and you could write so much about, you know, the, the salvation and the Christian life, and there's so much teaching there. But I think this mystery, hidden wisdom is a little bit deeper than that. In Corinthians, the mystery seems to be tied to the cross. See, Epp and Rosner argue, it is better to equate God's wisdom with the mind of Christ and to take them both to, ref in, in other words, wisdom and mind of Christ being equivalent, and to take them both to refer in context to the wisdom of the cross applied to everyday life. Now, I want you to think about that. that. He, they continue. This is precisely what Paul offers the Corinthians in the letter as a whole. Now, when you think about life issues, and you're thinking about dealing with some problem or another in your Christian walk, uh, how do you approach dealing with that? How do you approach encouraging yourself or you know, uh, and motivating yourself or correcting yourself. You know, maybe you go to Proverbs and look for some wisdom there. Or maybe, you know, read some scriptures that, out of the Old Testament stuff. Well, listen to how Paul is addressing these things in Corinthians. In chapters 1 through 4, the wisdom of God is the recognition that the cross spells the end of the world's power and wisdom and provides a solid basis for Christian unity. In chapter 5, the sacrifice of Christ, our Passover lamb, is the reason for purifying the assembly by removing the incestuous man. In chapter 6, 1 through 11, uh, righteous suffering instead of self-assertion is recommended with the implicit example of the crucified Christ. In chapter 6 to 12, the redemption achieved by Christ is a major reason to honor God with your body. Likewise, in chapter 7, being bought with a price is the reason not to become slaves of human beings. I mean, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you know, become a slave through, through debt and that kind of stuff. That's good principles and everything. But Paul's like, he's going beyond just good principles and proverbs or all that stuff. He's saying, you've been bought with a price, you belong to someone else. Therefore, you shouldn't be made slaves. Or in chapter 8 through chapter 11... Verse 1, it is because Christ died for our weaker brother that we imitate Christ and avoid causing our brother to stumble. In chapter 11, 17 through 34, the recollection of Christ's sacrifice for us reveals the utter unacceptability of behavior that demeans those who are members of his body. In these and other ways, wisdom may be defined by Christ and his cross. So the, the wisdom that Paul is speaking to the Corinthians centers on the cross. In other places, Paul identifies specific aspects of God's mystery or God's hidden wisdom, including the union of Jew and Gentile in one body, the indwelling presence of Christ, and even the rapture. But here, the focus is mostly on the cross. Now, this is an interesting verse. And in verse 8, it says, it brings up another question. Uh, it, it says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. They didn't know the hidden mystery wisdom of God. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now let me ask you, why wouldn't they have crucified him? 
What do you think? If they had known God's hidden wisdom, why would they not why would they have not crucified the Lord of glory? At the beginning of their end? Okay. Self preservation? Okay. Opposition to God, yeah. You know a lot y'all are smarter than the commentaries I read. The, the commentaries either didn't address this or seemed to think that that you know they wouldn't have done it because they had realized that that oh well I need to, I need that to be saved, as if if they'd have known they'd have ceased opposing God. I don't, I don't get that at all. Matthew eleven Matthew twenty one verse thirty eight says. But when the vine dressers saw the sun, this is the parable of the vine dressers, you know, and they had been rejecting all the prophets. When they saw the sun, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. In the, in the parable, Jesus is saying, They knew who the heir was. They knew. They didn't know the hidden wisdom of God, but they knew who the sun was, and they rejected him and killed him. They wouldn't have done it if they'd have known. Because then they would have, you know, furthered God's plan. In fact, Thistleton is the only person that, that really said this. He said, If they had had access to God's wisdom, which decreed the effects of the cross, or indeed, have could, or indeed could have known that the cross formed a central place in God's wise purposes, they would not have lent their aid unwillingly to furthering these purposes. They wouldn't have been willing to help God along the way of, of bringing about his plan by crucifying Christ. He said, oh, no, no, that's how God's going to do it? No, we're opposed to God. We're not going to help God out. The demons certainly wouldn't have been involved. They don't want you to be saved. If they'd have known that the cross was going to win salvation for you, they'd have stopped right then and there. Oh, don't touch him. Don't touch him. Instead, they went forward and crucified him. They, drew, they drove the rulers to crucify. One other interesting question here is, what is Paul quoting in verse 9? But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered the, into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. This is a rather difficult uh, quote because it doesn't readily, it's not readily identified. It's probably Isaiah 64.4 with maybe uh, Isaiah 52, 15, thrown in there a little bit. Uh, it's kind of, there's not a clear, direct quote here from Paul. But the point is amazing to think about. God has far more planned for us than we can even conceive of our own. It's amazing what God has planned. Fortunately, he has revealed some of it through the, the apostles. We know something of it. And, and God's plan goes through the cross. That's the wisdom. It's the wisdom of God. And it makes the wisdom of man utterly foolish. And so God, in doing, uh, in sending Christ to die on the cross and accomplish our salvation, has a plan that, that we could never even think of. There's this uh, lady on, on the internet on youtube her name is christy and she has deconverted from christianity and she's and I, i'm kind of preached on this a little bit recently on the translation thing and but she's kind of concocted herself as as god's judge apparently and and um, and so she's come up with all the wrong things about the bible and the wrong things this and one of the things that god didn't do was make sure that we all got a good translation so therefore must not be a, go a god because he didn't Make sure that, that, you know, there's no bad translations out there and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and I'm thinking, leaning on her own understanding, she's come up with her best, you know, critique without even thinking about what else would be true. That if you had a divine translation, you'd have to have one for every language of the world and whatever, 100 years maybe? You'd have to have a new divinely inspired translation because language changes so much. And, I mean, how many inspired translations does she want? And, and, and so, and how would she know if it was divinely inspired translation? So, you know, using her wisdom, she comes up with a, with a complaint, but she doesn't even see all the problems that would have to be addressed. Using our wisdom, the cross may look foolish to us, or at least it did maybe before we were saved. But 
once you get saved and you understand the, the plan of God, you begin to see the wisdom of God. And guys, there's much more to come. There's, there's a whole lot more going on in our salvation than we know. Some of it's been revealed, and I think some of it hasn't. It's going to be amazing. And here's the thing. This world is the world in which we prepare for that world. It, this is the world in which we store up treasure for the next. This is the world in which you prepare yourself to be a ruler over many cities. In other words, to have responsibilities or whatever. Whatever the plan is. I mean, I don't always have it figured out, but whatever it is that God's planning, I can tell you right now, we will be suffering loss on that day if we are not living for him now. Yes, it's an amazing plan, and we're going to love it. It's going to be amazing, but in that first moment, we're going to know what we lost, what we could have saved up and treasured in heaven. Instead, we left here on earth behind. It's an amazing thing God has planned for us. We don't know what all it, what all it is, but we get something of the wisdom of it through the cross. And then Paul continues, he says, but God, in verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, the things that he has planned. Again, to whom has this been revealed? I, th I still think it's the apostles. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, the, the point that Paul is making is pretty clear. Lowry explains it this way. He says, nobody can fully fathom the thoughts of anyone else. How much more necessary, then, is the work of the Spirit if the thoughts of God are to be known? You can't know them without the Spirit. You can't know what's going on in God's thoughts unless he communicates them to you. And even when he puts them on, in writing, we're going to see that there's still a problem because... Uh, the, the way the natural man functions. And that's what we're dealing with next, the natural man. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So we have received the things of God from the Spirit of God, and, and that there's freely given to us. We you know, so Paul says that's what we speak, and we do so not in words with man, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, consp comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. Now, what does he mean by that? Comparing spiritual things to spiritual things. The Greek is actually very unclear. I mean, it's simple, but it could mean four different things. First, either the uh, apostolic teachers combine spiritual uh, things or words with spiritual things, subject matter, kind of what we're looking at, comparing spiritual with spiritual. Or, two, they interpret or explain spiritual truth in spiritual language. Or, three, match or combine spiritual matters to spiritual hearers. Or, four, interpret spiritual truths to spiritual hearers. That, that, that those last two kind of, kind of almost the same. But the second part of that, is it, is it, you know, spiritual words? Is it spiritual, is it the people who are hearing? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of ambiguity here. But what is clear, whatever Paul is meaning in this, is that who receives the things of God and who doesn't? Those who receive and those who don't. So th that's clear in the, in the overall context of what he's dealing with. Is it that we compare spiritual things with spiritual things, or, if he, or is he speaking spiritual things to spiritual people? Uh, probably that one might be, you know, what's going on. But what's clear is that 
spiritual people receive spiritual things and the natural man does it the man of the flesh verse 14 but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness to him nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned this word natural is sukikos and it means the unredeemed man devoid of the spirit he does not receive or welcome, that's that word has the idea of welcoming, the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolish to him. And therefore, not having the Spirit, he cannot know that which can only be discerned through the Spirit. If I have to have 3D glasses and I want to go watch a 3D movie, but I don't have the 3D glasses, am I going to see in 3D? No. you got to put on the goofy looking glasses. You know, and look like a nerd. A bunch of nerds sitting in the movie watching this thing. Without the Spirit, you cannot know God's mystery wisdom, the hidden wisdom. But how do you get the Spirit? How do you, how do you welcome and receive spiritual things without the Spirit? So the natural man in his lost state can't do this because the things of God are foolishness to him. So some interpret this as meaning that the natural man is utterly devoid of any spiritual ability to believe. And, and even without, without being regenerated, without getting the spirit, you can't believe. I don't think that's what this passage is saying. I think that this passage is actually saying that the, the natural man doesn't welcome the things of God because they're foolishness to him. What happens when you try to talk to somebody about sin? They don't want to hear it, right? And you start talking about sin as serious business, and they either get offended or they think you're being ridiculous. There ain't nothing wrong with a beer every now and then, you know, but hey, you know, you're not drinking a beer, you're drinking whiskey. <laughs> you know? Well, they downplay. I never murdered anybody. You know, they, they start getting, you know, antsy when you talk to them about sin. They start fishtailing because it's foolishness to them. I dare say that some of our sins, when we're confronted with them, seem a little foolish to us. I guarantee you there's things in your life that if somebody came along and started pointing out, you'd go, oh, you're being ridiculous. You're being ridiculous. And God's thinking, no, they're not. <laughs> That's sin. And you're not willing to deal with it. I guarantee we all have that. But the natural man has it in spades and never receives and never humbles himself like we talked about last week. Never takes that first step of humility. And remember, God gives grace to the humble. Never humbles himself to acknowledge his sin, to receive the witness of the, of the Spirit. And what's the first ministry of the Spirit? To convict of sin. And when that conviction comes, they refuse to receive that conviction. And so if they don't receive the conviction, they can't repent, can't believe, and can't receive the Spirit. And if they don't have the Spirit, they can't know God's Word or God's hidden wisdom. You can't know it. It's spiritually discerned, Paul says. So they can't know, not because of their inability, but because they refuse. They refuse to hear. The very first thing, you're a sinner and you need salvation. They don't want to hear that. So... Paul continues with an interesting thing, an interesting statement. He says, in verse 15, But he who judges, I'm sorry, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet him, he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So the natural man, using the wisdom of the world, cannot even assess the things of God cannot judge the spiritual man. Larry says, like a deaf critic of Bach or a blind critic of Raphael is the unregenerate critic 
of God's word. A blind man trying to critique Raphael's paintings and masterpieces or box music from a deaf man. So the natural man has no access to the wisdom of God to be able to judge those who are spiritual. But Paul does. Paul does. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ. And so Paul then steps into the next stage of this discussion. He confronts the carnal Christian. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able, for you are still carnal. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal, behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulos, are you not carnal? Bloomberg says, in this passage, Paul continues the theme of godly wisdom as the key to growth in the Christian faith, which chapter 2, verse 16 through, 6 through 16 introduced. So that the, the verses 6 through 16 introduced this, this idea of godly wisdom as the key to growth. But now he shifts from contrasting Christians, those with the Spirit, and non-Christians, those without the Spirit, to comparing two kinds of Christians— those who are being controlled by the Spirit and those who are not. And so, this, the, the, the spiritual man judges all things. It is rightly judged by no one for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ, so Paul's going to lay his judgment out. And his judgment is, I couldn't speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal. See, the Corinthians despite having the Spirit and being endowed with and enamored of the spiritual gifts, are nevertheless not spiritual people. Now, what does he mean by this? He's kind of, he's kind of equivocated on his term here. Now, he doesn't mean one who has a Spirit, but he means one yielded to the Spirit, one maturing in the Spirit. So, uh, he couldn't speak to them as mature, as mature people. He's not able to address them as such. Now, he's not attempting to establish two classes of Christians. That's a mistake that a, a lot of people make from this text. Rather, he's just trying to uh, address an obvious problem. What's the problem? Division in the church, lack of maturity. He's trying to address that. And he's saying, you know... When I came to you, I couldn't speak to you as mature people, but as to carnal, verse uh, uh, 1b and following. I couldn't speak to you as spiritual, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it. The, this, the idea here is that they are of the flesh, carnal. In his initial visit, Paul addressed them as such. Because they were just babes in Christ. They had just converted. And for 18 months, he taught them the rudimentary aspects of the faith. That was to be expected, right? How many of y'all felt like you were, you were mature within the first three months of your Christian walk? Well, y'all ain't as egotistic as I am then. <laughs> My ego said I was mature the instant I got saved. And I was telling everybody about it. You know, I was just a babe in Christ, often walking in the flesh. God used much of that, but nevertheless, uh, we don't start out there. We're, we're just babes in Christ, and Paul taught them for 18 months the basics. And that's to be expected. Because in some sense, new Christians are still just people of the flesh. They haven't come to experience the Spirit in such a way as they grow and mature. Now, I don't know if this is the way to interpret this passage or not. I believe it is. Some scholars may argue. But I think that, that Paul is doing something here. I think he's addressing what's natural and normal, and then in the second part addresses what's not natural and normal. Because he actually uses two different words. He just said that you, you were carnal. In the Greek, that's one word. But then in verse 2, the second half of verse 2, 2b, it says, 
And even now, so now I'm, I'm talking to you, I am still not able to speak to you as spiritual people, for you are still carnal, different word. Not, not real different, but just a little bit different. It's an adjective in the, in the Greek. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? In other words, yes, this is to be expected when you're a babe in Christ that you're carnal. You're, you're new to it. But you're still carnal. And here's the proof. The divisions among you. You're still fleshly. Again, I'm not, this is not two classes of people. This is a problem that he's addressing. Immature believers who are not moving forward in the faith. The, uh, Hebrews addresses this. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. You've been saved long enough, you ought to be teachers. This is the oughtness of the Christian faith. For this, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. So there's an oughtness. You get saved. You ought to be growing. You ought to be maturing. You ought to be a spiritual person. But division and all this other stuff that goes on in Corinthians is evidence that they are still carnal. And Paul says, or whoever wrote Hebrews, which is Paul, but, uh, <clears throat> okay, we don't know, but still it was Paul. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. There it is again. He's a babe. He's unskilled, not mature. But solid food, the hidden wisdom of God, belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. They weren't discerning good and evil. They're dividing over these teachers. They're not seeing the, the, the real problem here. And so they're immature, they're carnal, they're not, they haven't matured and grown. They haven't come to full age or maturity. Uh, some texts read perfection, and it's the same word, being completion or mature. Now, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, to maturity, to completion. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. Let's go beyond the basics of the faith, guys. Let's, let's move into the mature wisdom of God. Can I speak to you as spiritual people, or do I have to continue to speak to you as babes in Christ, Paul is saying. You know, I know... There are a lot of churches that continue to speak to their congregations as if they're babes in Christ and never give them meat. And I wonder, you know, I used to complain about the pastor that would do that, but sometimes I wonder. Maybe it's not the pastor's fault. Maybe he's tried to give them meat and they choked. You know? Uh, maybe the fault lies in the hearers, not the preacher. Paul says, I couldn't give you meat. I had to speak to you as babes all over again. Just kind of reliving the foundational principles. And the, the writer of Hebrews says, let's move beyond that. It's not, not that you get stuck there. So are there carnal Christians? Well, there certainly shouldn't be. But that is what Paul calls them. But now, does this set up a two-tier system of elite and non-elite Christians? No. It just recognizes that some Christians mature and some don't. And we need to deal with that. We need to address that. And so let's do that. Let's apply this. How do we apply it? First, receive the Spirit. Humbly acknowledge and repent of your sin. Agree with God about its seriousness and don't think the idea of sin is foolish. Then embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. It's pretty simple. We all know the basics. We all know where we're, we start with. And if you haven't gotten there yet, you need to get there. But the second thing is grow as you're supposed to. 
There is an obvious time to be a baby Christian. It often even comes with a honeymoon period of zeal and excitement. But growth is normal, and you should be growing. Lombard points out, he says, It is deeply ironic that the generation with the greatest number of accurate, understandable translations of the Bible, replete, replete with the study helps from, from brief, uh, brief annotations to massive commentaries, should be one of the most biblically illiterate societies in the history of the church. You know, before there was computers, people actually sat down and figured out every word of the Bible and put it in, the, in a thing called a concordance. Can you imagine the mind-numbing effort that that took? But guess what? Somebody passionately loved God's Word. Enough that they didn't play video games and watch TV and, you know, run out and do sports and all the other things that distract us. And they literally went through every word of the Bible and said, okay, this verse has this word, and put it all in the concordance. I mean, people said that... that, that some of the study that's been done on God's Word amazes me. The, the minutia and the monotony of it. I could never do it. Unless maybe I didn't have all those other things to distract me. And I actually loved God's Word as much as they did. Maybe then I could. Maybe if I moved on to maturity. Let's grow. Let's study God's Word. Let's get deep into God's Word. Let's understand his plan. That's what the hidden mystery is all about. God's plan. What he's about. The future. The, the eschaton. It's not about the here and now as much as it is about what's coming. And we need to understand that. And finally, don't resist the Spirit's impetus for growth. If you haven't grown as a Christian, it isn't God's fault. I don't even think it's your church's fault. I had no one disciple me, never in my whole life as a Christian did anyone ever sit down and disciple me. I just didn't have access to that. I discipled myself. I got God. Now, I went to church. I got teaching, but I got God's word and studied and learned and grew. I didn't, I, you know, it would have been great if somebody had. I would probably have been better off and, and been able to disciple more readily other people. But you, you, you can initiate your own growth in the Word. In fact, God has already put it in you. There's an oughtness to your Christian walk. He's, the Spirit is impelling you. You literally have to be like a donkey and resist, you know? <clears throat> Stubborn mules are why people are immature. Not because God hasn't given you all the resources, and not because he hasn't put it in your heart and convicted you and moved you. It's because our flesh resists the foolishness of God. Well, that's just foolish. I don't need to live like that for Jesus. I don't need to get rid of this in my life. I don't really need to spend all my time thinking about God and church. And That's just foolishness. And they wonder why I never grew up. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we pray that you would help us to see that it is not foolish to set our hearts and minds upon you to walk in obedience to you to allow you to convict us of sin and, and move us out of things that, that we want to hold on to Lord we know that there are those who seem to be in a perpetual state of immaturity and your word even says that we need to move beyond that if you will allow and I think in some cases you've already said no and they've made their choice much like the children of Israel when they tried to repent of going into the, of not going into the land and you said no I'm not going with you and you made them wonder for 38 years until they were ready and I know that some of us sometimes end up in those places, Lord. But I pray, Father, that you would have mercy and you'd have grace, Lord. Forgive us our foolishness in thinking that your word, your conviction is foolish. Help us to see the hidden wisdom, Lord, that only is revealed through the Spirit.
Help us, Father, to confess our sins, acknowledge our sins, and turn from them, Father, so that we might walk in fullness of grace and have the joy and passion of knowing you, of serving you, or giving our lives for you, because there is nothing else worthy of that, Lord. You alone are worthy of our affections. And you alone are worthy of our thoughts all day long. Father, that anything that we think of should be in line with who you are and what your plan is. When we think of other people, we need to be thinking of them as someone that you love and that, that we want to love and that we want to see grow in Christ or come to know Christ. Help us, Lord, to live that life before you. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.